When's the last time you have been in a street fight? All right, think about it for a second. This could be a good lunch conversation. Go around the table, find out when the last time. I'm not talking like a Twitter battle or someone said some mean things or passive aggressive sarcasm. I mean like it literally was physical. You were in the thick of a physical altercation. Okay, think about that for a second. Mine was in junior high. It did not end well for me. And I, I'm a, I think like you said, I. I I don't, I think I'm nice, like I'm playful. I'm sort of like a Labrador. I'm I'm a playful person at heart. I don't have a lot of like rage or negative vibes, right? I don't normally operate in that. And yet for whatever reason, probably the street fight that went wrong for me. Since junior high, I have been attracted to like combat sports, okay? So, and by the way, this sermon is really to scare students to not ask for grade changes. That's what this pur- the purpose is. So I'm gonna t- say a few things. No, <laughs> so, so I, I was in junior high and high school. I started taking wrestling after that, uh, after that incident. And then in college, I did some boxing. Any boxers in here? Okay. <laughs> Any wrestlers? Okay, there we go, and there they are. <laughs> like when you do that, it's like, I, yes, that's like me in every sport. It's like, I sort of. <laughs> um, and then more, more recently, I started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Anyone do that? Brazilian, okay, all right. Dangerous people around here. So my goal is to make my whole body a weapon so as never to have a problem again. No, but, but there's, something about, there's something about being in physically agonistic contexts. There's just something about it when it's safe and there's boundaries and there's, you know, agreed upon things. It's really interesting. It's kind of this, this space where you get in touch a little bit with kind of who you are, right? In, in the parts of you you're not, you don't really know about. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, the first thing that happens for me in, in, in these fight contexts, right? They're simulated, they're nice, they're, you hug, they're good, okay? They're not mean. But you find out what your crisis default settings are, all right? So like in boxing, I was a terrible boxer. I am a terrible boxer. So I basically got beat up most of the time. And when you fight, you do the training and then you finally get into the ring and you start to actually box. And of course my first match was against someone very big. The weight classes weren't, it was community college. They weren't really keeping track of weight classes. And I'm in there and this dude just comes in and I'm like, okay, let's kind of dance around. He just starts wailing on me. And my first instinct is get away, like fetal position. It's my first instinct. Just curl up and hope it goes away. But you know, you want to, you want to turn your back and kind of cover yourself, right? Like there's an explosion. That's the worst thing you could do in a boxing match. It exposes you to all sorts of damage Uh, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Those of you that do this, you know this, it's all about chill, just relax. You would think like, oh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, these must be mean people, and no, these are the most chill people you'll ever meet. Like, keep your heart rate low. Out chill your opponent, that's the goal. But for me, when someone's on top of me, just suffocating me with their body, and I'm trying to get through like the folds of human flesh to just breathe, right? I'm panicking and I'm thinking as hard as I can push, right? So sort of my default settings, like all this great, great line, Mike Tyson, this is a weird sermon intro, you guys. Um, (laughs) Mike Tyson, there's this old military strategy saying that says no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right? Mike Tyson has a better way, better spin on it. He says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And there's something so true about that. Our sort of strategies, first I'll do this, then I'll do that, then I'll do this, and all of a sudden, boom, the moment of crisis hits, and what comes out is kind of what's deep inside of you, right? what's really deep. So for me, it's fetal position and crying and, and praying, which is spiritual and good. Your default settings take over. So the title for this sermon is Jesus in a Street Fight. Intentionally provocative, I wanted you to come to chapel. But what I wanna do today is just open up Matthew's biography of Jesus, looking at what we have titled chapter four and examining Jesus in a moment where he is in a full on, no holds barred street fight, okay? So if you wanna turn there, you can turn your Bibles there. 
Um, if you want to encounter it the way your ancient ancestors in the faith did, a lot of them, you can listen, right? Most were illiterate and listening to experience these uh, scriptures. So that's okay, that works. And I want to read through this encounter. Here we find Jesus, he's weak, he's tired, he's hungry, okay? He's been 40 days in the wilderness fasting. This is gnarly, to use an academic term. This is very, very serious, okay? And he's looking down the road at what is no doubt an exhausting, exciting, in many ways heartbreaking, and profoundly important traveling, teaching, healing, and self-sacrificial ministry. So this is what's ahead. And he gets punched in the mouth by Hasatan, the the attacker, the adversary, the tempter. And let's see what the street fight brings out. Let's just see what just gushes forth from Jesus when he is punched. What are his instincts? What are his reflexes? What are his go-tos? What are his default factory settings? Because for me and for you and for us, that is exactly what comes out when we are in legitimate crisis. All right, let's check it out. Matthew chapter four, verse one. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Dr. Cash will explain how the spirit uses the enemy in the context of this temptation after after our lecture today. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry understatement, the tempter, the tester, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. First punch is thrown, it lands. What does Jesus of Nazareth default to? What are his instincts? What's so deeply within him that it's the first thing to gush forth? And it's this great Greek, it's translated in Greek, as gegrapti. What a great term. Comes up a lot. Gegra- Everyone say gegrapti. One more time. Gegrapti. Gegrapti. Have fun with it. That's, that's half the joy of language. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He goes straight to the Deuteronomy scroll. Instincts. Factory settings come out of Jesus of Nazareth. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And then Satan takes sort of his tactic because it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He quotes from Psalm 91. Jesus answers him. Gegrapti, it is also written. Again, gegrapti. Everyone say, ah, oh, it feels good. Gegrapti, it is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. He's back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 16, as we've labeled it. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of all the world and their, and their glory. It's probably a great translation for it. All the glory, honor and shame, Mediterranean world, that is the thing you want and it's all right there. He shows it to him. Jesus is tired, he's exhausted. He has a Roman cross, the personification of shame awaiting him and pain and he now sees all the glittering glory and he says, get away from me, Satan, get grabbed eye. Yes, there it is. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He's back in Deuteronomy 6.13. The devil left him and the angels came and attended to Jesus of Nazareth. What are the default settings? Where does he go when the punch lands? When all the thin plans of humanity that we have set up, all of our scaffolding, all of our Steps one, two, and three, when they encounter the brute force of a crisis, 
of a temptation, of an attacker, of an executioner, of an enemy, where does he go? He goes to something so deeply rooted within him. So here's what I did to prepare for this sermon today. I got in a fight. No, I didn't. I, uh, I went through all of Matthew. I'm like, let's do something different. I'm going to just literally sit down with Matthew like I've never read it before. I have, I promise. And I'm going to read through the whole thing and just keep track of where Jesus uses scripture, where it comes up, where it bubbles up in his ministry. And then I made a table. You're so excited you came today. A table. There's nothing that preaches better than a table. And here's what I'm going to do for the next, I don't know, five minutes. I'm going to read the table to you. That's exactly what's going to happen. Sing a song in your head if you want. Escape to a happier place. I'm going to read, just go through this real quickly. I want the rhetorical force of just what's in the, just Matthew, just what's in there. I want that to kind of wash over you for a second because we are the Bible Institute of Los Angeles University, right? Like that's where we started. That's where we, our giant Jesus mural, right? What's giant Jesus holding in the mural? Right, it's a scripture. We really stand on this. We make a real big deal. Now, are we kind of out there? Are we a little bit weird or a lot bit weird in our cultural moment? Yes, we're totally weird. But let's look at the life of Jesus of Nazareth and just see like, what's going on with him. Okay, so sit back, relax, keep your hands and arms inside the ride as we begin this. So Matthew 4, 2, the wilderness fast I've mentioned. The wilderness fast, by the way, if you read Deuteronomy 9, Moses spends 40 days and 40 nights fasting, right, before the Lord. So Jesus here entering into that type, verse, uh, chapter 4, 1 through 11 we've looked at. We've already seen Deuteronomy 6 and 8 show up. Matthew 5 through 7, Sermon on the Mount. I'm not even going to list all the places where scripture comes up because it's drenched in scripture. Uh, Matthew 8, 4, after healing, Jesus tells a man with leprosy, go to the priest, fulfill Torah ritual requirements. A reference to Leviticus 14. 8, 11, references to the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, imagery drawn from Isaiah 25, among other places. Uh, chapter 9, verse 13, when attacked by the Pharisees for eating with tax collectors and sinners, he responds with Hosea 6, 6. God desires mercy, not mercy sacrifice. 10, 1 through 4, Jesus calls 12 disciples, as in 12 tribes of Israel. God's blessing to Israel, uh, Deuteronomy 27, among others. And then in Matthew 19, 28, to jump ahead, refers specifically to that 12 tribes motif. 10, 34 to 36, yeah, we're doing this, people. This is chapel today. This is what's happening, okay? You can't, you can leave, but you can't leave. You gotta hear this. Characterizing his ministry and disruption of households, Jesus cites Micah 7, 6. 11, 4 through 5, Jesus says to John the baptizer's disciples, tell John what Jesus is up to, and it's all about Isaiah 61 stuff, Isaiah 61 ministries. I can email this to you if you want it later, but I'm going to read the whole thing. 11.10, get grapti again. Jesus quotes Malachi 3.1 about John the Baptist's ministry. 11.23 to 24, Jesus references judgments against Sodom, Genesis 19. 12, 1 through 8, in, Sabbath, in a Sabbath controversy, Jesus uses the story of David eating sacred bread, 1 Samuel 21. 12, 39 to 41, the sign of Jonah is Jesus' sign, three days and three nights. 12, 42, the queen of Sheba's visit to Solomon is referenced, 1 Kings 10. 13, 14 to 15, Jesus' parable teaching is inspired by Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Read it and find out. 15, 1 through 4, in a purity, dis purity dispute with the Pharisees, Jesus quotes Exodus 20, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 16 on honoring parents. Then he quotes Isaiah 29, 13, they're near me with mouth, but their hearts are far from me. Should I keep going? Yes, yes, absolutely. Please don't stop. I know that's what you're begging for. 16.4, again, Jesus references Jonah, the sign of Jonah. 16.13, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man, reference to Daniel 7. 17.10 through 12, Jesus discusses Elijah and John the baptizer, 1 Kings 1 through 2. References. 18.16, he cites Deuteronomy 19 on how to 
uh, arbitrate grievances among the people of God. 19, four through six, on divorce, Jesus quotes Genesis one and two to underscore a one flesh marriage theology. 19, 18 to 19, a rich man asks about eternal life. Jesus quotes the 10 commandments and the love commandment, Exodus 20 and Leviticus 19, 18. We're almost there, but not quite. Let's keep going, 21 through 16, the vineyard imagery, uh, is used in a parable. It's, it's all over the Old Testament, especially Isaiah 5. Uh, chapter 21 through 5, Jesus is on a donkey in a deliberate messianic fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. 21, 12 through 17, Jesus quotes Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11 in his condemnation of the temple exploitation. 21, 16, Jesus quotes Psalm 8, affirming the messianic praise of children. We're almost there. We just have half a table left. I know it's sad. 21, 33 to 40, Again, a parable with vineyard imagery, Isaiah 5, and a direct quote from Psalm 118, 22 to 23. 22, 23 to 33, defending the resurrection. Jesus quotes Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the text. 22, 37 to 40, greatest commandment, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 18, 22, 44, dialoguing about messianic lineage. Jesus quotes Psalm 110. 2335, Jesus' curse to the rejecting Pharisees and religious establishment places them on them the blood of all the way from Abel to Zechariah, first and last martyrs of the Hebrew Bible. 2339, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, 26, 2415, his apocalyptic discourse includes the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Daniel 9, 11, and 12. 24, 29, we're almost there, references the day of the Lord, Isaiah 13 and 34. 24, 36 to 41, the day of the Lord will be like the day of Noah, Genesis 6. 25, 31 to 46, imagery from Ezekiel 37. God and God's Messiah will uh, be separating out livestock like sheep and goats, etc. 2611, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 1511 to rebuff his disciples' critique of the woman's lavish gift. Four more. 2631, Jesus quotes Zechariah 137, get grapti. 26, 52 to 54, Jesus corrects one of his disciples' violent defense of him by saying, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled saying it must happen this way? Reference to the scriptures. Two more, 26, 64, Jesus' only answer to the charges against him are quotations from Daniel 7, 13 and Psalms 1, 10. 10 imagery of the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father and coming on the clouds. Last one, I think the most powerful one, it's the end. Humanity, our, biologically speaking, he is emptied out. He is dying, socially speaking, he has been socially killed by the Romans long before he's physically killed, stripped naked, dying, hanging on a cross. What comes out? How does he process pain of that magnitude, betrayed by a best friend? while his other friends flee so fast they want nothing to do with him. They just want out of there. The sin of humanity, the rebellion, the balled up fists of generations, the oppression, the violence, the hatred, all dumped upon him. Where does he go? What moans come from the depth of Jesus of Nazareth? Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. He processes his pain. In Psalm 22, that's what comes from his lips. The point of all this, and I, I know that was a little bit weird for a chapel talk. I've never done one like that before. But the point of all of it is, is if you squeeze Jesus' life, it drips out scripture. If Matthew has any proximity to Jesus, if he's representing Jesus, which I think he is very well, if you hold Jesus' life up to the light, it glitters scripture. It's all over the place and it's so deep within him that it's not like he's in the sword drill in Sunday school. If you remember those church kids out here, know the sword drill, right? It's not like he's just, okay, what should I say? It's just coming forth because it's not something that was like a a stapled onto his life with 50 other things. It was actually so deeply ingrained in him that it affected him and it became instinctual. Right? And this is why as a follower of Jesus, this is one of the main reasons for me, there's others, but one of the main reasons why I am so 
wrapped up in this text. It's because my master, my Lord, my savior, my majesty loved these texts and saw life in them and God's transcendent perspective in them. And so, so this is not a chapel talk of like, read your Bible more, be a good boy, be a good girl, you'll get extra credit in heaven. It's not that, because when the punches land, you don't care about looking good in chapel. You don't care about knowing the right answer in a Talbot Bible class or in, in one of your Bible major classes. You really, it all goes away. You're, stu- you're left with what's like in the well. What do you smell like? Like what drips out of you? Right, what have you soaked in and marinated in for most of your existence? And that's actually what comes out as an instinct. Um, Daniel, how long do I have? I forgot. That's such a classy way to keep track of time. Um, okay, cool, perfect. All right, here, I want to... Uh, I wanna just give a couple tips, how about that? Some practical tips and I wanna end with a little story, just a very short story about my grandfather, my late grandfather, Grandpa Harris. Here he is, it's a huge picture, I know. I'll, you can look at it later, but. Um. <clears throat> a couple quick, quick tips, super practical tips for soaking in the scriptures, okay? And this is kinda of handcrafted for Biola students, knowing you're getting a lot of scripture. You're actually around it as an academic discipline. You're around it, here you are. Most of you scanned in. You're here because you love Jesus and you want those chapel credits as well, right? You're getting a lot of Bible. What are some super practical tips? Okay, here's a couple of them. First one, I wanna say read in big chunks. As much as you can, try to like charge through maybe a couple chapters if you get a chance even further. Try to catch the big motifs and themes of scripture. Bible memorization is amazing. Go for it. Do it. I love it. But I would also say, like, don't underestimate the power of just soaking in the larger themes of Scripture that just show up again and again and again and again. Uh, Here's another one. Um, Practically speaking, change up your Scripture reading routine a little bit. Sometimes you got to keep things fresh, right? Change it up. It's okay to change up your routine. For example, how many of you have tried to listen to the Scriptures? How many? Let's see a show of hands real quick. It's kind of, it feels like cheating, right? Like, am I allowed to do this? Does this count, right? And as I said at the first of this chapel, um, your ancient ancestors in the faith, most of them through most of history, especially the pre-modern world, that's exactly how they encountered these, through listening to them. They're actually written to be heard, right? It's one of the, the cool things about scripture. So we have all this great technology now to listen to scriptures. There's this great thing called Streetlights Bible. I don't get a dime from them. I don't know any of them, but it's kind of cool. They just read scripture and they actually have like a DJ that puts some music to it. So you can kind of work out, listen to the scriptures. You can go on a walk, listen to the scriptures. I know the Bible app, the, the voice gets a little creepy sometimes depending on which translation, right? Oh, not that one, right? So Change it up, but you can listen. It's okay to listen to scriptures. Um, Find a reading reality that works for you. Here's a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. The way to do a great deal is to keep on doing a little. The way to do nothing at all is to continually resolving, to to resolve that you will do everything, right? So there's this thing like, okay, once I get that morning off, I'm gonna dive into Mark. I'm gonna get that morning off, I'm gonna dive in. Oh, something came up, ah, not today. Instead, just go, what time do I have? What's happening right now? Am I driving to school? Boom, hit the Psalms. Just gonna listen to it, right? Am I gonna sit down and read one quick paragraph? Sure, it counts, it's okay. Find something that works for you to get yourself around it as much as you can. Um, Okay, finally, get over the honor, shame, or merit-based reading of scripture posture. Like, just drop that like a bad habit. Like, you're not a good boy or girl because you read the scriptures a lot. Right? You're not getting extra credit. You're not gonna get a sticker when you get to heaven because you read more than someone else. But instead, you're gonna dig these roots. You're gonna imbue yourself with something that will provide a stability and a like martial art of wisdom in the middle of crisis. Okay, here's my grandfather. No one can see this probably but the front row, but here he is heading off to World War II actually. Amazing dude, six foot four, legit guy found Jesus right after the war. My memories of my grandpa is him sitting in this like old school 60s couch. He was kind of balding at the time and he would wear like a, like a 
washcloth on his head. He just put it on his head. It was hilarious, like just a washcloth. I don't know why. He kind of keep warm and he just have his Bible out. And he just read that thing. In the morning, he just read that thing. He loved, the, the light on his face was so transparent. I had the privilege of being this hulking man, being in his, in his um, hospital room as he was passing. And my grandma, she's like of the persuasion that you just gotta eat. If you eat something, everything's gonna be better. And she's trying to get him to eat. You gotta eat, Bill, you gotta eat. And he's, he's like, grandma, he doesn't need to eat right now. And she's like, you gotta eat. And he kept saying, I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. And he's like, he's, he's passing. So what's coming out of him right now is like that, that which has been in him again and again. And he kept saying, I'll never forget. I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. And she goes, what are you full of? I'm full of love. I'm full of the love of Jesus. I'm full, I'm full. And my grandma goes, you can't live on love. It was like, my grandma. <laughs> but, but I'll never forget it. And my mom was with him when he actually passed. And he literally said, let me go. I see him. And for grandpa, it's like he probably, someone had to let him know that he had passed from one to the other because his life was so just saturated in the scriptures and it's what came out. And so for me, like for me, as I follow Jesus, that's what I want it to be about. And so when the cynicism of like, oh, another Bible thing or another Bible, or I better do good or I'll look good like a good Christian, like when all that can pass away and say, when you're in that furnace of life, what comes out of you is gonna be what you have soaked in. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.